Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julia Dolan. I am the Minor White Curator of Photography, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the museum today for this important talk about photography, self-representation, and photography of, by, and for African Americans. Before I introduce our speaker, I must take just a minute to extend my thanks to a number of people who have uh, made this lecture and the representing exhibition possible. First, we would not be here today were it not for the generosity of the Arnold and Augusta Newman Foundation. The foundation established in 2007 to honor and further Arnold Newman's photographic legacy has supported five years of photography lectures here at the Portland Art Museum. Because of the foundation, we welcomed Carrie Mae Weems, Richard Moss, Emmett Gowan, and today, Chun Li, to the museum to speak to community members and to work with students. In December, Dawood Bey will be our fifth Newman lecturer. Arnold and Augusta Newman's son, David, is a Portland resident and is here with us today. David, from all of us, thank you so much for your family's generosity. The representing exhibition came to life because of another Portland-based family. We are grateful to Bill Diaz and his wife, Judy Rooks, who are also joining us today. One of Bill's family albums, which is featured prominently in the exhibition upstairs, was the impetus for the entire exhibition. Bill's father, Carl, and his uncle, Robert, were two of just 12 Oregonians to serve as Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. Bill's incredible mother, Judge Mercedes Diaz, was the first African-American woman to be admitted to the Oregon Bar. The Diaz family has been so generous to share their photographs and memories of their forebears with us. Bill and Judy, thank you so very much. Finally, I would like to thank the museum's education department and members of the community advisory board who helped me to think through a number of issues surrounding an exhibition that features sensitive subject matter. Intazar Abioto, Lisa Jarrett, Renee Lopez, and Sharita Town, thank you all for your insight. And now I am thrilled to introduce today's Arnold Newman Distinguished Lecturer in Photography, Chun Li. Chun is a man of many talents and interests. He is a physician, award-winning photographer, educator, and speaker. His own photographic work explores black fatherhood, media stereotypes of people of color, and racial disparity in cities including Ferguson, Missouri. In addition, he has collected more than 3,500 Polaroids of African Americans, over 100 of which are currently on view in the representing exhibition. Zun's photo Chun's photographs have been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Time, the New Yorker, the Huffington Post, the Washington Post, and Forbes, among others. His work has been displayed in solo and group exhibitions in New York City, Washington DC, Toronto, Orlando, Los Angeles, and right here in Portland at the Up4 Gallery last year. He has lectured at New York University, the University of Chicago, Ryerson University, the University of Toronto, so many, the International Center of Photography, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and Columbia University as well. And he regularly conducts workshops about identity and photography with middle and high school students. He is a 2015 Photo District News Photo Annual winner, and he is also a 2015 Magnum Foundation Fellow. Please join me in welcoming Chun Li. I don't know who she was talking about, but um, <laughs> it feels weird to sort of hear my name in that context. And um, thank you very much for having me here. I want to play a small clip, and then I'll get into my actual talk. So without much further ado, I'm just going to play this clip. Right now in the media, we see a lot of black representation that's around 
negativity. It becomes newsworthy when black people die or are being victimized, or when black people sort of rise up in response to that. But we don't see black love and black joy and just um, like everyday moments that are very quiet, but at the same time very powerful. And so for me, it's like um, saying, no, these moments are important and they're here. My name is Chun Lee. I am a Toronto-based photographer and storyteller. My project, Fade Resistance, is an archive of 3,500 Polaroids that I didn't take. I was born and raised in Germany. Grew up with Korean parents who I thought were my biological parents. And then much, much later, I find out that my actual father is African American. My project Father Figure, which was about exploring black father absence and why we look at black males in a certain pathological way. And why do we not permit black men to be seen in much more humanized ways that are more nuanced and more complex? And that's what I wanted to capture with the work. Yes, I wanted to look at black fathers and how they're parent, but really the question I'm answering is why do we not see that in the media? You know, in the States, there was a great recession and a mortgage crisis, and a lot of families lost their homes through foreclosure, and disproportionately so, a lot of African-American families were affected. So I'm, I'm imagining that in that process, a lot of families also lost not only their personal belongings, but their family photos. In 2012, that's when I found my first set. I think it was in Chicago or Detroit, and I found literally photos on the street. And I thought somebody had lost them or dropped them, like, recently and I picked them up and I um, asked neighbors you know do you know these photos and they're like no and they told me well it's kind of common here like there's photos everywhere you see so much love and joy and then you wonder you know who would who would lose them over time I found a whole eBay community of vendors that actually sell them and I think over like the course of two, three years, I now have 3,500 and, and growing. It weighs on me to not really have the original owners attached to them. There's actual families who know what these photos meant and us speculating about them is kind of not okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very much mindful of that. That's why I posted them on social media. I want these families to just say, yes, that's us. Send them back to us or take them down. I personally, and that's probably another motivation, I don't have any family photos of myself. Um, so for me, that kind of fills a gap in my own history as well. So for me, it's looking at these and saying, wow, it reminds me of my own sort of history and growing up. So. You know, that's why it's so relevant to me to, to say the world needs to see that. Black love and black joy matters and that needs to be seen and foregrounded. Thank you so much. Um, that was today's talk. <laughs>
making this event possible. Julia and, and Mike Morosky, thank you so much for having me here and for, for all this hard work. I had had a chance to see the show earlier and um, this is the first time that these Polaroids were put into conversation with other archives of African-American family photos. And I think it was really important to see that in conversation and see the continuity of how people rep represented themselves, you know, and so, um, for me, it was actually sort of important to sort of see that this is not something new and not something old, but this is something that has always been here and will always be here for as long as black pe people live on this planet. And um, thank you to uh, the Diaz family for um, actually their personal sacrifice, not just their contribution, but for enabling the show to come together as it has. Um, I also want to acknowledge that um, you know, Portland sits on traditional political sites of um, Aboriginal peoples. And so, you know, I'm thinking specifically of Chinook, Multnomah, Kathlamet, um, Tuat and Kalapuya, Molala and other tribes who were displaced in 1854 and who now make up the confederated tribes of the Grand Ronde. And why this is important for me to mention is that um, a lot of the history of these photos that I collected are the result of displacement. And displacement is very much a history that isn't just in the past, but it's, it's something that's ongoing. And um, it's very much something that's an active process even today, and I want to speak to that in greater extent. And since we're talking about displacement, this is the question I ask at the beginning of every presentation I give, but given we just um, went through Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma is still churning, it's not a hypothetical question anymore. Um, so I feel there's a sense of urgency and realness to this question, but um, imagine yourself in a sudden flood and if you had just a few minutes to gather your stuff and leave, what would you take with you? And think about what that would be and then you probably get a sense of how some of these images ended up on the street and what the circumstances may have been most of the people that I speak to say I have family photos because you know once they're gone, they're gone. Um, clothes, other things, furniture, I can replace that. But my photos, when, when they're gone, they're gone. The New York Times on September 5th ran a story that was titled, What They Saved, Texans Reflect on Treasures Plucked from Harvey. It describes Houstonians returning home to search for cherished belongings they salvaged among the hills of debris piled up in front of the waterlogged homes. And this is a particular story I'd like to share. This is a lady by the name of Sonia Soldana with a photo book, photo booth snapshot of her and her husband. She says, and I'm going to read verbatim, um, in my bedroom I have my dresser. I have like so many pictures and I just keep everything. When I pulled the drawer, there was just water all in there because I had about four and a half feet of water in my home. I'm going to go through these and I'm going to kind of salvage them if I can and let them dry. This is me and my husband, maybe like 25 years ago. It was taken in a photo booth at a movie theater in Houston. I'm probably like 19 or 20. It just represents the beginning of us before we had our family. This is like the beginning and the rest of the pictures I have are like what comes after that. When I left my house in the water, um, when I left my house, the water was like up to here. We walked. I didn't grab anything, just my dogs. Things can happen at any minute. It doesn't matter your religion, your age, your nationality. When things happen, they just happen to everybody. I thought that was a very poignant story. But I want to, in that vein, I want to share some images without saying much. Some of them were taken. Um, in Harvey's aftermath, and some of them represent families that, that lost their home through eviction. And um, I want to maybe ask you, you know, if you can tell which is which.
I don't know about you, but um, to me, the two scenarios kind of look the same. Um, they're indistinguishable to me. Um, and not to say that the events are related in that sense, but you know, the, the, the sense of urgency and the, the disruption such events cause in somebody's life are pretty much the same. Um, there's a Harvard sociologist named Matthew Desmond who wrote a book called Eviction or Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. He won a MacArthur Grant and a Pulitzer Prize for, for that work. But arguably, his work has been the most comprehensive study on eviction across the country. Um, and here's what Matthew Desmond had to say. Um, if you think of a period of great economic and social distress, uh, usually people say, uh, or they reference the, uh, the Great Depression of the 30s and 40s. And during that time, um, evictions could be counted in the hundreds. Um, today, they're actually countable in the millions. Um, Hurricane Harvey destroyed about 100,000 homes, and there's probably hundreds of thousands of more homes that are now uninhabitable. And it is estimated that millions of Americans are evicted every year bef because, simply because they can't make rent. Um, Desmond cites um, work he's done in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where, which is a city of about 105,000 rental units, but every year, roughly 16,000 adults and children get evicted. That's 16 families a day. New York City, that number is 60 families a day. And what this work highlights is that um, a process like an eviction isn't just something passive or something that just sort of happens to people who um, can't afford to pay rent or lose their home to some economic misfortune. Um, evictions actually have become a driver for poverty, not the other way around. And this is happening on a massive scale. I mean, you know, just if you look at the numbers, there's literally dozens of Hurricane Harveys happening every year in America, but we really don't see the, the emotional, economic, and social toll that that takes. So if you think about that, you know, everyday life and the, the, the images and stories that come with that, um, that's something that's really precarious and it hangs in the balance on a daily basis. And that's really something I want to talk to you about today. Um, am I saying that every family photo that ends up on the street is the result of eviction? No, cl clearly not. But you know, what I am saying is that the process of family images ending up on the street is not a casual or trivial one. There's a rhyme or reason behind it. And not every situation is catastrophic, but I don't know about you, but nobody gives up their family photos voluntarily and nobody just throws them out on the street. So what, what does it take for somebody to, to do that or to leave their family photos behind? So the segue to today is then, you know, what exactly are family photos? What are the pictures that we have in, in, in our albums and now increasingly on our cell phones? You know, what function do they serve and what do they actually represent? What do we seek to memorialize and why? And why is it so important for us to have our own record of what we looked like to us? You know, and when you look at an exhibit like the one that's hanging here at this museum, you know, what do these archives tell us about our personal and also our collective histories? Clearly in an hour I don't have answers to all these questions, but um, the reason I'm bringing these questions into focus today is because um, our personal family photos are more than just vernacular snapshots. You know, that's almost like a dismissive way of saying, you know, maybe these photos are not art or fine art, or they don't deserve to be seen in that same light. Um, but really, even if you look at the show today, which I had a chance to do um, earlier before this talk, you can clearly see that they represent a chronology of how we define and value family. Um, how we stay connected to loved ones and how we experience trauma as a result of um, migrations through space and time. You know, the clip kind of hinted at how I got to collect the Polaroids that I have, but I'll get into a little bit more detail here. So in 2012, um, I was in Detroit, Michigan, where I was photographing the other project that was briefly referenced um, and I literally found the first set of photos on the street. 
and they looked really new to me, like somebody had just dropped them. And you know, when I asked people around the city, you know, if they knew any of these people depicted, they just kind of shrugged and said, "Well, you know, what's the point of looking for these people? There's there's so much of that on the street." Um, but I felt compelled just to take them home and not just put them back out there. Um, from then, when I went back to Toronto, I did some research online and I found an entire vendor community online, mostly in the greater Los Angeles area. And they also sold Polaroids of black families from Los Angeles. And doing more research, um, there's vendors all over the states popping up, mostly on eBay, you know, some in Oregon, Nevada, Texas, the Midwest, um, Pennsylvania, New York, and even in the South, Georgia and Florida especially. And um, they're selling these Polaroids for a buck or two each on, on eBay. The most interesting part is that, um, you know, a lot of vendors from across the states sell them, um, and these pictures are mostly local. But I think about 90% of my collection comes from the greater Los Angeles area. And these pictures from Los Angeles, Los Angeles are actually dispersed throughout the states and sold you know, from multiple places in the States. So if you think about the fact that, you know, you have pictures from Los Angeles, they get scattered through all states in, in the US, and then they somehow end up with me in Toronto, and now they're here in Portland. <laughs> you know, the, the history of dislocation and migration continues even as we, you know, do the work of remembering what this work actually means. So as, as I mentioned in the clip, there's about 3,500 of these um, photos in my collection. Um, again, mostly from Los Angeles. And they cover the entire period during which Polaroids were popular, the late 1960s up until 2005 when Polaroid went out of business. Um, and they, they feature pretty much every moment of family life from cradle to grave, um, milestone moments, births, deaths, weddings, graduations, and just personal intimate moments that we really don't know what they mean except, you know, that, that two people got together and made a photo. I'll show some of these photos that are um, even featured here and some may not be, but just to kind of give you a sense of what, what kinds of images they are. Um, some pretty much give away a specificity of location or a certain time period based on a wardrobe or a certain subculture that you see depicted. So on the left you can see, you know, there's a couple on the beach and clearly it's, it's marked as Santa Monica. In the middle you can kind of guess from a long flowing satiny gown, you know, from what time period that might be. <laughs> um, and um, I found a biker gang um, or a set of biker gang pictures. Um, and, you know, maybe you can read it, but the, the gang's name says Street Player and I tried to research um, anything about them, but I couldn't find anything. But there's about 100 pictures I have of that gang, and you know, it covers everything in terms of them getting together, riding their Harleys on, on the street, and you know, sort of, so that they're very personal in that sense that they mean something to the membership, but maybe not something to people that are not part of that, that, that group. Um, as you know, I'm very partial to black fatherhood pictures, and there's, there's tons of them in the collection. And what I love about them is that um, not only do they depict father-child interactions, but there's such an affection and closeness and, um, you know, you can really see the con connection between the fathers and the children. And, you know, that's something that oftentimes um, is deemed as not, not possible in the media. Somehow we don't see pictures of African-American fathers in, in loving engagement with the children. Many, many pictures of, of women, either solo or in groups or in intergenerational contexts. And, you know, if you can really, I don't know if it comes across, but the colors are just amazing. Um, you know, the two on the left with the, the matchy matchy blouses, I mean, the blues are just popping. Or the lady in the middle, these, these reds and, and, and fuchsias are just sort of really saturated. And, um, you know, there's, there's really something about just the sheer visuality of, of the Polaroids when, when you see them in person that kind of makes you stop and wonder what, what, hap what happened to these families. Um, I like these sets of pictures, you know, people sort of proudly posing 
in front of their family photos that you see in the background. Because for me, that kind of reminds me of Bell Hook's essay in Our Glory, um, Photography in Black Life, where she describes walls of images of, um, um, of family photos in African-American homes. Um, and for, for Bell Hooks, these walls of images represented um, you know, sites of resistance, you know, sort of a powerful location of construction of an oppositional black aesthetic, as she calls it. And yes, that seems a bit political, but um, imagine you know, yourself never being seen in the media or in the news. You know, so what does it mean to actually then create a shrine of, of your own image, of your own family, and, and put that up in your home, and then celebrate yourself against it? So there's such a vivaciousness and exuberance and love and joy in many of these photos that you know, even though we don't know these families um, and we don't know what their context was, but it becomes immediately recognizable to us and we can easily empathize with that. And I think um, UCLA scholar Robin Kelly um, made a beautiful statement in, in a book by Deb Willis um, called Reflections in Black. And I'm just gonna read it verbatim because I think it's really beautiful. Um, Study these photographs and you'll discover in the gaze and gestures of ordinary African Americans a complex and diverse community too busy loving, marrying, dancing, worshiping, dreaming, laughing, arguing, playing, working, dressing up, looking cool, raising children, organizing, performing magic, making poetry, to be worried about what white folks thought about them. And I'll get back to what that specifically means um, later on in this talk. But I wanted to sh spend some time to just to talk about the Polaroid as, as an object and then what this object means or what meaning it generates. And then finally, what does it mean to relate to this Polaroid as an object that you hold in your hand? Maybe think about what it means, but then also what makes it okay to think about that as an aesthetic experience if that's not something, if, if there's nothing in that picture that you can actually relate to. So I'll talk about the objectness of the Polaroid first. And there's a lot of information on that slide, but um, I don't know how many of you remember Polaroids. I'm sort of dating myself. <laughs> but to me, it was a thing to actually hold something in your hand. And you know, Polaroids have that smell, especially when it just comes out of the cartridge. And you hear the, the whir of the engine, and you, know, you take it out the cartridge, you hold it. You're not supposed to shake it, you're supposed to rub it. I'm just saying. Um, so <laughs> sorry, Andre 3000. Um, don't shake it. Um, but you know, like, it had a haptic experience to it. Um, you know, so you had to not just look at it, but you had to experience a Polaroid with all of your senses. And you know, that creates a relationship with this, this object, and not just because it's something visual. Um, when I say performativity, you know, um, there was eight Polaroids in a cartridge. And you know, yes, Photography got cheap, but Polaroids were expensive, and you didn't want to waste any. And so you knew you had to make sure, sure you have the right pose, you have the right light, you know, and really it became a production. And so people performed in a way to make sure that, you know, they were seen in a, an appropriate way. Um, proximity of experience and output sounds, you know, grave, but really th this just means that um, you know, when you actually look at the Polaroid and wait for those two, three minutes to have it develop, you create this relationship between making this, this, this object, but then also what this object represents, much more so than taking a bunch of film to a store and then getting it back a week later or saving something on Instagram. Like, there's a certain connection between the actual experience of what happened when you made the picture and what you actually then see. And that's, you know, I remember when I look at some, some of my Polaroids, I remember exactly who was there, who said what to whom, what we talked about, what we didn't like about the picture. So, you know, that memory's there, and it's there because we have that relationship with the object. Um, there's no negatives, so when it's gone, it's gone. That's what I mean by one of a kindness. So, you know, just to add to the sense of precarity or loss, when you lose it, it's gone, and there's no other record of it. Um, and the social messaging, you saw this Polaroid earlier with the caption that says, you know, we're chilling on the beach in Santa Monica. Um, this is kind of like Instagram, if you really think about it. 
Um, so people actually left other information on these Polaroids to, to share that with others. So even if a Polaroid wasn't meant to be shared with the public, it was certainly meant to be shared with other friends or family who, who might have known what that context means. Here's sort of a favorite picture of mine. It's kind of meta because it kind of describes the whole process of what I just talked about. You see a bunch of people sort of grouped together, um, sort of pouring over some Polaroids. And, um, you know, they're smiling. They're looking at probably one, one of them is kind of developing. They might have just taken them or it might have been a recent event. And you can imagine them trading stories or sharing, you know, commentary about like, who looks good, who doesn't look good. Um, and you know, and then somebody takes a picture of that, so it's kind of very meta. Um, so in that sense, I, I kind of just like to share that image because it kind of represents what I talked about, the Polaroid as an, as an object. The second thing I want to talk about is the Polaroid then as, as a vehicle for meaning or meaning making. Because you know, it, it's one thing to look at a picture that, that you took or that you're in, and so you know exactly what that means, and that's sort of the personal realm, the first bullet. Um, you know, so when you can say, I know what this image is because I'm in it and I know what happened, that's a very personal connection. Um, you can relate to it from a cultural point of view. You know, if you look at an image and say, that's not me or that's not somebody I know, but because I'm part of a certain group of belonging, I know what that trope means. And then there's a universal context around these images where you know, I can relate to what's depicted because I empathize with, with what's shown, whether it's a father-daughter picture or um, a, a, a mother-son picture or anything that depicts moments that we can all empathize with. And so these layers of meaning kind of collectively codify a certain way of life. You know, that becomes sort of important because um, you know, if you look at pictures of people that are not related to you or that you don't know, and you don't really know what's going on, how do you make sense out of these pictures? You know, how do you know that, oh, you know, based on what somebody's wearing, that's a graduation picture, or based on what somebody else is wearing, that's a wedding picture, or because people are posing a certain way that was a specific moment that means something, not just to whoever was in the picture, but to me as well. And so there's a certain code at work. And what I mean by code is, you know, that in many images, there's sort of a standardized set of rules, you know, based on poses, on clothing, um, furniture maybe, um, maybe the backdrop, that points us towards determining what the shot means. Um, in this slide, the second bullet is the most important for me, which is that you don't have to know what the code means. You just have to know that it exists for the image to work for you. You don't have to know, you know, what specifically makes a graduation picture a West Coast picture, because you know, might not know what a certain fashion sense was at the time, but as long as you know that the code works and you understand this is a high school prom and not a wedding, then you know, the code still works. The deciphering isn't part of the understanding. And I think that's important when we talk about cultural specificity. You, know, you might look at a picture and say, well, you know, these are not people that I know but the code still as, is at play here. Um, what I wanted to do today is not just talk about the archive and a historic way of looking at it, but really connect the ex exhibition to contemporary image making. And nowhere is that more evident than on Black Twitter. I don't know if you know what Black Twitter is or even care about it, <laughs> but I love Black Twitter, not just because um, I spend entirely too much time on Twitter looking at that stuff, but um, Black Twitter is really a contemporary archive that you can mine for meaning making. Because what Black Twitter is, is really, you know, a bunch of people come up with a hashtag, and then that hashtag starts trending because others pile onto it. And um, they add their own images to it. And, you know, there's, there's tons of campaigns that kind of speak to that. But um, I picked out a particular one that, um, was tagged as growing up black, and you see all these tropes around what people posted as growing up black. Um, there's probably four out of the six that, that I can personally relate to. I'm not gonna share what, the, what those are. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just to pick out one, there's um, on the top right, you see the, the plastic covered furniture. Um, and 
it's kind of interesting because uh, you know this this speaks to the notion of code again. Um, actually, I had a conversation about plastic covered furniture for I think four hours with somebody. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> there was a lot to remember and talk about, and you know, and you know, again, there was a haptic experience, especially in the summertime when you get up and you know you're wearing shorts and it sticks to your skin. That that feeling, um, but. But see what just happened, everybody's relating to it, right? You're laughing um, because you understand what that code is, you know. Um, where I get pushback is when people say, well, that's not a black thing. We all had plastic covered furniture, so why is it a black thing? And I'm like, you're right. Plastic covered furniture isn't necessarily a black thing, but then why do black people come up with a hashtag and why is there the sociality around it? You know, like what makes Black people on Twitter remember that as a thing, and that's where the code comes in. You know, so it's not about what's depicted that makes it a black thing, but how people remember what's depicted and how how to make it theirs, the reframing of it, that makes it a black thing. Same with all the other things, because even on Twitter, people said that's not about growing up black; that's about growing up poor. And so again, there was this sort of pushback around, you know, what makes images a certain way and. Where does cultural specificity come come into play here? But you know, I don't want to sort of fall on either side of this argument. I'm just saying that I didn't see any white people come up with that hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, on a more serious note, this is Black Twitter again, and this becomes more part of what I really want to talk about today. Um, you know, black Twitter also is good for social justice-like campaigns. So this is a hashtag called, if they gun me down. And this trended for two, three days after Ferguson, when Mike Brown was killed. Um, and this was in response to the question of, if they gun me down today, what picture would America use to describe me? And what happened is that thousands of black millennials posted diptychs of themselves to protest how mainstream media criminalized Mike Brown in the aftermath of his death, where Mike Brown was described as superhuman, violent, aggressive, a potential um, mischievous kid, marijuana smoker. There was even reports that he had stolen something from a store, and there was a video last year actually from the store that refuted that. But basically, this was to say that America criminalizes black people and black bodies. And this is how we're going to counter that. You know, so you see on the left, people kind of posting stereotypic pictures of themselves of how America would likely show them in pathologized ways. And on the right, you see how people, you know, think of themselves as they actually are, as professionals, as doctors, as lawyers, as soldiers, as, you know, productive members of society and valued family members. And so for me, this is, again, the code at play, you know, not only in, in terms of how we see ourselves, but also how America tends to look at us. And for me, that's important because uh, we often think, you know, when we look at archives, that all these issues that the archives address are in the past. But very much what these campaigns show is that um, even younger generations have a very keen sense of awareness around how their bodies are being perceived and how they're being pathologized. And you know, it takes nothing for a campaign like this to come together and kind of show that black people are actually really vigilant about how, how their bodies are being perceived. Which brings me to the last and probably most problematic aspect of, of what these Polaroids mean. Because you know, if you know that these images are not of people that you know, and if these are not even your own images. Um, how can you look at them and enjoy them as an aesthetic experience? Can you even just look at them in a purely aesthetic way? Um, you know, as mentioned, um, there's a keen sense of awareness um, among black people around how black bodies are being traumatized and violated and victimized. and. Um, how that violation is then depicted in the media. Um, I specifically think of an essay by Elizabeth Alexander, poet and Yale scholar, who wrote an essay called, Can You Be Black and Look at This? 
reading the Rodney King videos. So she uses the example of the Rodney King beatings and the videos that circulated, and she uses the Emmett Till casket pictures that also circulated to come up with an argument that says, you know, these images circulate for white media consumption, but for black people, when pe black people look at these images, they re-traumatize and they cause people to not just look at them, but actually to, to, re, to recall that trauma in a visceral way. But that also motivates black people then to reframe and reclaim the narrative. So when it comes to these Polaroids, you know, what does it mean to look at this work and not look at the background of how this work ended up in a museum like this in the first place? Can we just look at that and say, oh, that's nostalgic? Or do we have to also look at the history of displacement and the history of how people had to give something up in order for us to be able to enjoy them. Now I go back to sort of contemporary examples just to illustrate what I mean by that. Because, you know, when I ask the question of what makes it okay to look at Polaroids of black people that we don't even know, the question that comes up is what is really at stake here? You know, so even if we acknowledge the loss and the dispossession and displacement that came with it, what is at stake when we look at pictures of everyday black life? And I'm going to go around the, um, my argument a little bit, but if you do an, a Google image search on a term that we all know by now because it's so ingrained in our sort of um, zeitgeist, um, if you Google the term Black Lives Matter, you see these, these images coming up. You know, black people protesting, perhaps even rioting, holding up signs. Um, and so that's something we collectively remember from the news. But, and I'm not saying these images are not important, because they are, because they started a national conversation around police brutality and, and racial injustice. And they also triggered, you know, people to come together in different places to start a movement. So I'm not saying these images are not helpful or not valuable, but is that all that there is to it? You know, for me, I see a lot of people holding up signs that say Black Lives Matter, but we actually don't see pictures of, of black life mattering. You know, so I want to see pictures of what these signs are talking about. You know, what does it mean that when black lives matter? What does that look like? And we never see that. Um, and the question again is, um, what goes missing from mainstream reportage if the focus is always on these iconic watershed moments of protest, but not what these protests are actually about? Here's an even more contemporary example. Um, if you Google Charlottesville, you'll see pretty much the same thing. You see clashes of protesters and, and people who want to uphold certain ways of life. And they don't look that much different from what we just saw, except that some of the roles are reversed and maybe some of the causes are not the same. But again, I want to ask, what is really at stake here when we look at these pictures? You know, what, what are these people actually marching about and protesting about and countering? Um, you know, was this a conversation about monuments, about revisionist history, about civil rights, about freedom of speech. Is this really what, it, what, what was at stake here? <laughs> Sorry. Um, speaking of Charlottesville, this is actually from Charlottesville. <laughs> um, and you know, this, this, is, this is in 2015 at the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center where I had a show in 2015. And um, this is actually only a few blocks from the, the escalations that we all witnessed on television. But um, the point I'm showing this picture, actually I have two points here. The first one I want to make is, um, I mean, look at this jumpsuit. <laughs> <laughs> with, complete with the brass clasp, like come on. Um, I could never pull this off. Um, and, and talk about visual self-representation and, you know, wanting to be seen in a certain way. I mean, like, talk about intentional. Um, and so I was just happy to stand next to this gentleman. But the second point I really want to make here is, um, um, 
you know, to answer the question of what's at stake when we look at these images, because um, I don't know if you know this gentleman, any takers by chance? Um, the name of this gentleman is Uriah J. Fields. He was a founding member and original secretary of the Montgomery Improvement Association that organized the 1955-56 Montgomery bus boycott. And he was so gracious as to come to the opening of the exhibit and spend some time with me to talk about his experience. Unfortunately, I couldn't really focus on the conversation <laughs> because I was so distracted by his jumpsuit. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the reason I remembered this conversation is because you know we, we talked about what it means to show pictures of everyday black life and what is really at stake here. And here's what he had to say, because we talked about, um, you know, I had a question to him because I was really curious about how did the civil rights movement happen? How did it come together? Because um, if you think about the 1950s 50s in the Deep South um, and the oppressive conditions at that time, how was such movement building possible at that time? And here's what Mr. Fields had to say. Um, for him, the civil rights movement wasn't really a movement in that sense that it was a singular thrust held together by a bunch of charismatic leaders. Um, there were many small and larger uprisings happening all over the South, and some were televised and some weren't televised. Some were not organized and some were really well organized. But by and large, um, people didn't have leaders. They organized themselves. And the uprisings weren't primarily about responding to the man, as he said. This wasn't about the man. Um, sure, that was a huge part of it, but that wasn't always the primary driver. Folks organized themselves during that time to take care of themselves, to take care of their everyday needs, you know, how do you keep businesses open? How do you protect the church? Um, how do you buy groceries? How do you take your kids to school? How do you go to work and how do you come back home from work? Very basic everyday questions of taking care of yourself. Um, and so yes, the overall now in hindsight, the Montgomery bus boycott is a civil rights achievement and is a major social justice milestone. Um, but again, this wasn't a direct response to oppression in that sense. Um, more importantly for Mr. Fields, the bus boycott was an opportunity for increased cooperation and self-care and community building among black people. You know, this is how we took care of ourselves because nobody else would. And so it was about improving everyday black life, whether or not the man cared about it or not. And because it is in the everyday, that black life is contested and challenged. That's why this answer that Mr. Fields gave me made sense to me. You know, it's not about protest and resistance. Yes, it is, but what, how we protest and resist is largely informed by how black life is being challenged. And black life is not challenged just in the big watershed moments. Black life is challenged in the everyday moments. And I'm not sure if you remember these images from, from you know, just several years ago. But if not, on the, on the top left, you have Walter Scott in South Carolina. You have Mike Brown on the top right. You have Sandra Bland on the, on the bottom right. And you have Eric Garner on the, on, the, on the bottom left. But the reason I'm showing these images is that there's nothing special happening here. You know, or there was nothing special happening at that time. You know, somebody was walking down the middle of a street. Some, somebody was pulled over over a routine traffic stop. Somebody was maybe even selling Lucy's, but that wasn't a big of a deal really in the grand scheme of things. So, you know, it's not, it's simple moments, but they're not that simple. You know, what I'm trying to say is that there was something more profound at play here in these moments because they all ended up in tragedy. And what I'm trying to say here is, and what Mr. Fields tried to convey to me is, is that, that our struggle to assert our humanity does not just unfold in the big moments that are televised. Um, because these types of scenarios happen every day, we just don't know about them because they're never shown. Um, but that's what systemic and structural forces continue to seek to erase and negate 
everyday black life that just unfolds, you know, quietly and without much fanfare. Um, and so on a, fundamental level, on a fundamental level, I think we have to resist our ongoing dehumanization by foregrounding that we are simply enough, you know, we deserve respect and, and, and love and recognition, not because we, we resist or protest or we insist on a greater dignity among everybody, but simply because the people that are shown here are American citizens and they're human beings. That's all they need to be. They don't need to be anything else. And so to answer the question that I asked earlier, that's what's at stake here. You know, and that's what ultimately um, rewrites flattening narratives. And that's why exhib exhibits like this are important, showing something that people think is nothing special, everyday black life. But that's actually what's contested here in this country. So, you know, whenever you see mainstream media focusing on, on black people as, as either corpses in the street or as pathologized individuals that really don't deserve any respect. Again, on social media, you see, you see how people actually want people to be remembered and people are really vigilant about this. So, you know, when Mike Brown is described as, as a teenager, teenager who was up to no good and potentially robbed a store, this is how social media, you know, memorialized him as a high school graduate who, was, who had aspirations to go on to college. This is Eric Garner, a family man and a father of six. This is Walter Scott, a former US Coast Guard. And this is Sandra Bland, who actually, when she was stopped by the police, was on her way to Florida to start a new job and a new life. And so this is why it's important to show everyday life, because that's really who we are. I'm showing my age again because I'm quoting um, Jitu Wiyusi. I don't know if you know who that is, but um, he was an educator and an activist in New York. And he wrote this in November 1977. <laughs> um, and I'm really showing my age here. But um, I haven't used this quote in a minute, but I think for me that sort of beaut beautifully encapsulates what, what comes together today for us here. Um, he said, we came together thinking that if we could only prove to the white world just how valuable we really are, white folks would give us the freedom, justice, equality, and self-determination that we so justly deserve. We would punish them by showing our absence, and they'd be sorry, and they would even make certain concessions. How childish we were. We were again reacting to the fury and design of the beast. And I think, that's why it's important to focus on moments that are simple and um, moments that don't seem to be meaning much to anybody, um, if just to the people themselves. Um, you know, what really matters here is that the struggle for human dignity and social justice isn't carried out in the public arena. It is happening in people's lives, in people's homes and in people's relationships. And as it's still happening to this day right now as we speak. And that's all I have, all I have for you today. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So I thank you for answering that. Thank you so much. Good question. We have another question over here. Uh, hi, my name is Allison. Uh, hi, Allison. I was just wondering, uh, you have also been a physician. I was wondering what inspired you to pick up the camera and, and to uh, pursue photography. Um, that was my question. And then my comment was um, just, I don't see a lot of us here. Um, I, I wonder what the Portland Art Museum is doing to reach out to the community because I know it's your first time here, but there is a black community in Portland. And um, it's just a shame that uh, knowing that a lot of people would be interested in, in hearing what you have to say that there aren't more of us in the audience. Thank you. I'll, and I'd be happy to do my part to, to facilitate that if, if desired. Um, so to answer your first question, um, I actually never liked photography. Because again, for me, photography wasn't something that I was interested in because I never saw myself in any of these pictures, right? So um, for me, it was just like, okay, why am I looking at pictures of people that are not like me? Um, and I wasn't interested in the technology either. Um, I'm not very technical, <laughs> um, so when I had to learn all these buttons and f-stops and apertures and, you know, ISO, I was like, okay, um, you know, and actually, this is being recorded, but um, <laughs> don't be afraid of auto and P mode. <laughs> Because I think it's more important to let the camera do its job, but then really just look at what you're framing and how you're actually composing the picture and you know what you're bringing back. The camera, at least in my case, is nine out of 10 times smarter than me and kind of knows its settings and what I'm about to do. So I trust the camera in most jobs. Um, do I know now how to operate a camera and, and manually and all that stuff? Yeah. but. Um, um, you know, the reason I picked it up is um, I had a really stressful job um, in 20, 2009, 10. Um, I quit medicine a long time ago and I became a corporate healthcare executive. Um, and I was traveling and working and traveling and working. I was never home. And one of my coworkers actually gave me a camera one day and said, okay, you need a hobby. Because, um, <laughs> um, true story, but um, I came home from work and um, I tried to water my cactus and I realized it had died. So, <laughs> so pets was out of the question. Um, but a camera, you know, has no feelings, so I could probably use the camera. So for me, um, you know, it started out with that. Somebody said, you need a hobby, and they gave me a camera, and I kind of just haphazardly went through it. Um, it was maybe a year later that I... Um, unintentionally photographed two homeless kids in Toronto on the street and they engaged me in an hour-long conversation and I realized, um, you know, I can do something more than just take photos. I can engage people with what I'm doing. Not just because I take photos, but just with the process of having a camera and people realizing, hey, let's start a conversation around what you're trying to do. So for me, that's how it all started. Um, so it was never about the images as it was about the stories that I can communicate to other people. So. Got a question back here. Sure. My name is Jenna. Hi, Jenna. And uh, I grew up in the Deep South. So when other people were reading about the things that uh, happened during the Civil Rights uh, mm -hmm. Movement, we were actually living them. Uh, I was at the University of Alabama when mm -hmm. George Wallace stood in the door. Uh, I certainly remember the Montgomery uh, bus boycott, Selma, the whole thing. And I just wanted to say how important what you're doing is. I mean, this has Thank just you. been wonderful, and you should keep doing it, please. I'm going to try. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate your comments that you made at the beginning of your speech about this being tribal lands uh, here in the Portland and Oregon area. I'm a member of one of the Oregon tribes. But my question is, uh, our national um, football team, the uh, Washington Redskins, is still a very successful corporate <laughs> entity. And I work a lot within the Indian community locally and nationally. 
how would you make a recommendation to change that kind of uh, wow. perpetual image uh, making? Wow. <laughs> I thank you for your question. I mean, um, for me, these things are still problematic. You know that certain corporate names or um, sports teams still have names that sort of harken back to a racist past and that 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 is still something that's being seg celebrated um and not just celebrated but kind of shrugged off you know it's not a big deal you know it's just sports it's just people are trying to have a good time and enjoy themselves why why do you have to ruin the moment that you know, it's a national pastime, we're trying, we're trying to have a good time. And I'm thinking that's actually why it's important to have that conversation that, you know, again, for some, some of these, for some of the people that look at these images, um, they're just nostalgic sort of trips to the past. And for other people, you know, you know, as you saw from the clip, there was a show in Toronto and there was a, there was a very binary reaction. Um, I'm, I'm just keep it real, but um, a lot of black people just looked at the images and said, what happened to these people? They never s looked at these images and said, oh, you know, that's what we did. That's nostalgic. I remember how life was in the 70s. They just looked at these, these pictures and said, I feel pain because like somebody lost their pictures. So it was a very differential reaction. And I think the conversation has to be moved the same way when it comes to conversations such as, you know, why do certain teams still have racist names? That um, it still causes actual pain. There's, there's, it's not just about names or pastimes or um, you know people trying to just like um, or people overreacting. You know, which is always the argument that gets made is like you know people just seem to have a thin skin. But this is an actual issue of of trauma, um, and I think um, as a physician, that's always where I try to take the conversation that. Um, you know, there's a reason that people feel traumatized and that this is not just something trivial. Um, do I have any recommendations? Um, I think corporations respond to the bottom line and I think that's where the driver has to be. Um, I think um, there has to be a connection between social justice and also the bottom line. <laughs> so unless the bottom line is affected um, I don't think the needle will be moving because I don't think leaving it to the owners of these teams to make, make the connection is, is going to really bring about the change. So um, for me, then it would be about, you know, how do we start that movement towards raising that awareness and putting pressure on, on these corporate owners to make those changes. Um, you know, I, boycott? Somebody said that? <laughs> That's one strategy. <laughs> For me, it's, you know, I'm Canadian, so we don't, you know. <laughs> um, it, it's, for me, it's hard to talk about these things because, um, you know, there's always a perception that Canada is better um, or uh, th that Canada has it all figured out and we have this young, sexy prime minister and he's not that bad and... We are just not that bad. And the truth is, is, it's actually much more difficult to have a conversation around social justice in Canada because of the perception that we're not so bad. And we can always point the finger at, at, at the States, especially now since January. Um, <laughs> but it prevents a real conversation from happening if, if people do not perceive themselves as having the same problem. And how do you make people even aware that, no, we still have issues that we need to talk about you know, so for me, it's important to do work like this where people see, oh, I'm actually complicit in this dynamic. You know, it's not, I'm not just consuming these images, but I'm complicit in the dynamic of what's happening to these families. And so, you know, that's, that's always an important conversation to have that nobody get, gets a free pass here, not even myself. You know, like, what does it mean for me to be able to collect these and then show them somewhere? You know, is, is that a good thing? You know... Um, so I grapple with these issues a lot, and for me, it's important to say that I'm struggling as much as people that you know would would accuse me of you know you're just taking advantage of people's pain by collecting that and showing that. Um, I'm, I'm, and I would say, yeah, I agree. And so for me, then, 
what else do I have to do around this work? I can't just exhibit this work. I have to do a lot of work around it in terms of education, in terms of awareness building, in terms of other things. Um, to to sort of say you know yes I recognize I recognize my own position of privilege in this matter, and for me then to say what what can I do about it. Um, so it, it didn't really answer your question. I'm sorry, but you know I mean as an artist that sort of that's sort of my contribution to this world. So. Hi, I'm Lisa. Hi, thank, Lisa. Thank you so much for being here. Um, first You're and welcome. foremost, thank yeah. you. Um, I just wanted, I had kind of a comment and then also a question. Um, thank you, I just wanted to thank you for continuing to raise the question, what's at stake here? Um, I'm having a kind of really strong reaction to this particular set of work at this time. My family's in South Florida and I just left a few weeks ago. Wow. And I'm kicking myself for not taking all the pictures. Um, but while I was there, uh, my mom just brought this envelope out one day and said, okay, so I've been trying to figure out who these people are in our family. Yeah. There's six pictures, right? And we just can't figure out who they are. Um, and when I saw this exhibit, and thank you so much, Julia, for, for bringing it together, um, that was the, m my response was, wow, it's so amazing to be saturated with these images of joy and celebration and just everyday life, as opposed to the saturation of images from the media, which I don't know about how everybody else feels in the audience, but I've reached a point of like super saturation. Mm -hmm. I can no longer consume much of that imagery. So this was really refreshing. Um, my question to you as an artist, you, you mentioned early in your talk about being raised in Germany, and I'm thinking about this notion of migration stories and displacement. Um, and you know, sort of when I see pictures like this, even my own family pictures, it's kind of like, is that my mommy? Is that my, right? It's always like, is this my history? Um, I'm wondering how you, you think your personal history has affected your attraction to images like these uh, in the Polaroid collection. Well, wow, thank you for this question. Thank I you. hope your folks are okay, Me first too. of all. So, um, and, and anybody in this audience, if you have friends or family, loved ones in, in Texas or in Florida, I, you know, I hope everything is okay. Um, but absolutely, I mean, all of my work is autobiographic or autoethnographic in that sense, because um, you know, that's a huge motivator in terms of what draws me to certain images. Um, you know, so um, I was born and raised in Frankfurt, Germany, and then um, did all my schooling there, and then I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and then to Toronto, and when I wanted to move back to the States, 9-11 happened, so the border shut down, and I couldn't get a visa, so I was stuck in Toronto, but I always try to be the fugitive, so um, I managed to get this corporate job, and then moved to Philly for a year, and then moved to Chicago for a year, but in the end, I always had to come back to Toronto, so I'm always in a perpetual state of migration, if you will, or displacement. Um, and so as a result, I actually don't have images of my own family with me, right? So they're somewhere at home in Germany, but I don't have images of them. And, you know, my family is not that kind of family that would scan them and digitize them and send it to me. So it's, you know, it's sort of like, if you want to see them, come, come here and look at them, right? Um, so, um, yeah, so for me, it's, you know, this project especially is about um, remembering the people who loved and nurtured and take care of me, took care of me. And it's a bit more convoluted than the movie um, speaks to because um, um, and you know, I know we don't have much time, but um, in Germany, I was actually raised by African American soldiers, um, you know, from, from, from the time I was three years old. And um, you know, my parents were both working and really never available, either physically or emotionally. And so I actually randomly followed African-American soldiers home. I don't know why. And they just looked at me and said, you know, where are you supposed to be? You know, so um, they just kind of took care of me um, until I was a teenager, you know. And so everything that I, that I know about life and um, my, my politics, my positionality comes from that experience. So, um, and then the pictures I, I, I found or the pictures that I try to make are pictures of situations or of people that make me remember what that was like because I don't have pictures of that time with me, you know, so um, anyone that wasn't a military or maybe somebody was that was even stationed in, in Germany or in Frankfurt, maybe, no. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, when you're stationed there after one, two, three years, you get PCS somewhere else. So, you know, I would find a soldier who would kind of take care of me and then after a year they would all disappear you know um and 
back then there was no internet or Facebook or anything. So when they, they were gone, they were gone. I would knock on a door and found that person to be gone. And, you know, I didn't know anything about how to get, get in touch with these people. So there's always this sense of loss that's attached even to my history. So, um, yeah, so when I find pictures of people in the street that kind of remind me of, you know, people that I used to grow up with, then that's a very specific connection that I have. I just also wanted to thank you for this presentation. It's incredibly thought-provoking. You're welcome. Um, I really resonated with the images you showed of the police brutality and then, um, and it kind of made me think back to your slide about the family pouring over the Polaroids and having family photographs in the background and that was resistance. And then my mind also kind of flashed to Gil Scott Heron's song, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Right. So I just wanted you to, if you had any time, just talk to how art and positive resistance can be overlaid on the media, sa the image saturation and the negativity and the feeling of futility of it that I think we all kind of get from the negative media where art can be so life affirming and um, everyday imagery can be powerful in the resistance. Wow, thank you so much. I mean, um, that's a great question and I hope a fraction of my work can have that sort of aspiration. Um, I'm just gonna say, um, I just photograph what I know. And so what I know is informed by how I grew up and the people that raised me and surrounded me with, with what I need in life. And so I photograph the things that I know. And you know, coming here from Germany and then moving to Canada and coming back here and moving back to Canada, you kind of, um, always get bombarded with narratives that contradict what you know. And so for me, all I can do is to just to put out what I know. And um, I'm just gonna find a way to say it in a non-sarcastic or non-negative way, because um, honestly, I'm a little tired of um, what's on the news every day. Like I'm, I'm already saturated. And I think actually that's part of a certain someone's strategy is to just make us tired to a point where we don't care and wh where we don't no longer have any vigilance. But um, I am exhausted. Um, and so for me, it's important to say, you know what, I'm not really doing work in response or in reaction to what's being fed to me, but always to make work that comes from within and work that I know to be true. You know, it might not be somebody else's truth, but, you know, you know, and that's why um, when people say I'm countering somebody's stereotypes or I'm debunking or demystifying, it's sort of part of the equation, but it's not the entire equation. But because when you say you're countering something, that means you're acknowledging that somebody's stereotype is real and somebody's stereotype exists and somebody's worldview matters. And I'm saying, no, actually, that's that's not even what matters. I can't center your worldview in my work, <laughs> you know, so I'm not debunking your view of my situation. I'm just putting my stuff out there. And your reference isn't even something that I want to address, you know, so that's, that's just how I position my work is, you know, um, the normative center isn't really what I'm trying to debunk. Because for me, the normative center really doesn't play a role in my work. That's, that's all I can say to that. So Thank you so much.